Warm welcome to this session on sustainability standards and smallholder farmers' opportunities to address poverty through trade, where we are going to present and discuss the findings of the new ISD State Sustainability Initiatives Review, Standards and Poverty Reduction. The report will be officially launched next Tuesday, but we are able to share with you the link to the report today in the chat later on. My name is Cristina Larrea, lead of the sustainability standards work at ISD and co-author of this report. And it is my pleasure to co-moderate the session. We are very pleased to, to, to partner with UNTAC to co-host this webinar as they are contributing authors of an important chapter of this report related to smallholder farmer market access and standards. Why we are here today? Well, I'm pretty sure that all of you who joined the session are eager to reduce poverty and improve the livelihoods of about 500 million smallholder households, who according to the World Bank, mostly, mostly farm in less than two hectares of land and are a significant share of the world poor. To make our engagement even more critical, we know that the COVID-19 pandemic has reduced the income and limited the trade opportunities of many of these smallholders before a slide, please. Furthermore, continued biodiversity loss, deterioration of natural resources, and the effects of intense weather patterns are undermining the livelihood strategies of many of these smallholders across the world. Can you go to the first slide, please? However, we are not here today just to get a reminder of the urgency of our commitment to reduce poverty among smallholders in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. If I may, we are here for at least one thing, to discuss solutions to address poverty in agriculture through trade, specifically via the work that voluntary sustainability standards do. Why? Because agriculture is key to reducing poverty and sustainable farming practices are critical for building resilience, preserving biodiversity and enhancing farmers' natural assets. Because trade, when considers smallholders' needs and views, can open market opportunities for farmers to sell their produce while rewarding efforts that advance sustainability. And because the standards aim at supporting smallholders to farm sustainably and to open market opportunities for them by convening different actors, including buyers, consumers, producers, investors, and policymakers. Next slide, please. At ISD, reducing poverty is at the heart of our mission. We aim to accelerate solutions that can address the causes of poverty to enable smallholder farmers build sustainable livelihoods. Through, through the state of sustainability initiatives, we conduct research, facilitate dialogues like this one, and we provide advisory services to support actors making informed decisions related to standards with a view to advance sustainable and inclusive value chains. Next slide, please. As mentioned earlier, an important part of this research was carried together with our partner, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. UNTAD supports development countries advance their Sustainable Development Goals agenda through sustainable trade. UNTAC is also the Secretary of the United Nations Forum on Sustainability Standards, UNFSS. Next slide, please. Today, we will look at the findings of this review. We will hear how we have unpacked the dimensions of poverty and how standards can contribute to improve them based on their design and reporting of evidence. We will learn about the factors that limit and others that enable smallholder farmer access to standard compliant markets, since enabling smallholder market access is critical for standards to contribute to poverty reduction. And finally, we will hear about how policymakers buyers and the standards community can take actions to maximize the potential of standards for contributing to poverty reduction. I would like to acknowledge that the development of this ISE review and the organization of this session could not have been realized without the support of the government of Sweden, for which we are extremely grateful. Following the presentation of main findings, we will hear the feedback for, of five experts and authors of this report and enable a dialogue between them. We will also open the floor for questions to the audience. Please formulate your questions in the Q&A chat. We will be able to direct them to the speakers. For today, we have a distinguished lineup of speakers that I would like to warmly welcome. 
Honorable Christophe Asivamo, Deputy Secretary General, East Africa Community, joining us from Tanzania. Mr. Norbert Tujishimi, Program Officer, of the Eastern Africa Farmers Federation, joining us from Kenya. Mrs. Marike De Pena, Managing Director of a Fair Trade Certified Banana Cooperative Panelino in the Dominican Republic, and Chair of the Alliance of the Fair Trade Producers Network of Latin America and the Caribbean, Africa, Asia, and the Pacific, joining us from Dominican Republic. And Mr. Hank Gilius, Manager, Research and Impacts at Rainforest Alliance, joining us from the Netherlands. Warm welcome to all of you to these sessions, and thank you for being with us today. We have also our colleagues at UNTAD and contributed authors who will speak through the session. Nimatala El Amin, Associate Economic Affairs Officer, and Santiago Fernandez de Cordoba, Senior Economist at UNTAD and Coordinator of UNFSS. And finally, we have my colleagues at ISD and co-authors of this review, Sara Elder, Lead Author and Policy Advisor, and Anne Wilkins, Associate at ISD. Without delaying, I would like to give the floor to my colleague, Sarah, who will present the main findings of the review and facilitate the dialogue with our experts and authors. Please, Sarah, thank you, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Christina. Next slide, please, thanks. As voluntary sustainability standards increase uh, previous in number and prominence, it's important to understand whether and how they can contribute to poverty reduction for smallholder farmers. And that's where our report comes in. On the next slide, we see we've defined poverty as more than a lack of income. It includes hunger, limited access to education and other basic services, and a lack of participation in decision making. In this report, we take a multi dimensional view of poverty, highlighting three key dimensions of poverty emphasized in this UN and other definitions of poverty access to resources, opportunities and choice, and power and voice. For our research, we reviewed the key literature on poverty and developed the framework of poverty you see here, which identifies key aspects of each of these three dimensions. Next slide. Overall, our research indicates that voluntary sustainability standards can support broader strategies for poverty reduction. We find that standard criteria align with several key aspects of the three dimensions of poverty and that evidence suggests they can enhance these specific aspects in practice. For smallholder farmers to be able to access these markets and the benefits, there needs to be a number of enabling conditions in place. So see on the next slide, we first examine the criteria of sustainability standards to see if they align with aspects that are important for poverty reduction. So we map the content of 13 major standards in the agricultural sector against the framework of poverty reduction, which you saw on the earlier slide. Here you see, for example, how standards production criteria obtained from the International Trade Center standards map align with indicators of compliance with human and labor rights, a key aspect of the power and voice dimension of poverty reduction. Next slide. We found that sustainability standards criteria align with several key aspects of the three dimensions of poverty as summarized by this figure. We found that standards tended to have highest coverage of criteria that correspond to those that are typically incorporated in national legislation or international conventions. So things like minimum wage, worker health and safety, freedom of association. They also have high coverage of criteria relating to training and skills development, producer organization and association, and natural resource management. For example, in terms of opportunity to sustainably manage natural resources, the criteria targeted most relate to sustainable farming practices like preventing soil erosion, surface water, uh, groundwater pollution, and enhancing sustainable irrigation. They also apply to legally protect, uh, protection of legally protected biodiverse areas and high conservation value areas. And some standards cover certain aspects more than others, but we see that overall, they could, do, they could better address premiums, living wage and living income, climate adaptation and mitigation. So things like reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, carbon sequestration, and further 
sustainability standards could better support direct involvement of smallholder farmers in consultations and standard related decision making and through easier compliance mechanisms. BSS could also better integrate gender equality in their criteria, for instance, related to women's access to land, training, and markets. Next slide. But to understand how this coverage plays out in terms of actual outcomes in practice, we reviewed 12 meta studies from the academic literature on voluntary sustainability standard impacts. Overall, it's difficult to say definitively what the impacts are for poverty reduction. However, we were able to garner some insights from the existing evidence on aspects of the three dimensions of poverty that we have defined. So there's evidence that sustainability standards can help farmers improve access to resources through better prices for certified crops, through forest conservation, soil conservation and watershed protection, increased social capital via producer organization and links to supporting actors. So extension services, financial service providers or buyers to secure sales. It remains less clear whether standards lead to higher net household income. And there's potential for them to do more to support land access and diversification. There's also limited evidence of impacts on gender equitable access to resources. There's evidence that standards can help create opportunities for employment and decent work and opportunities to manage farmland sustainably. So via training on improved farm practices and soil and water preservation but not in all contexts and not for all workers, for example, those hired by smallholder farmers. The evidence is mixed as to whether VSS increase market access, and there's a lack of clarity on whether women have greater opportunity as a result of participating in standards compliant markets. So the evidence suggests that standards can support smallholder power and voice through compliance with labor rights and access to grievance mechanisms, but producer access to information around standards and direct involvement in decisions and processes remains limited. Overall, then, we see alignment between the criteria that standards cover and evidence of some positive outcomes on the ground. However, overall effects on poverty reduction are inconclusive and we see that they're context specific. In the next slide, so to understand the factors that influence smaller access to sustainability standard compliant markets, we partnered with our colleagues from UNCTA to interview actors in six commodities and value chains in six developing and least developed countries in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. In total, we interviewed 57 smallholder producers and their representatives, government officials, standard certification staff, NGO leaders, financial service providers, and buyers. I'll provide some brief insights into our findings here, and my colleague Nima from UNCTAD will add greater detail in the dialogue. Next slide. We heard from interviewees that farmers able to access standard compliant markets see these main benefits in line with what we saw in our criteria coverage analysis and our review of the literature. But interviewees also explain that few smallholders can access standard compliant markets and therefore these benefits that you see here. Next slide. They reported several constraints that limit smaller farmer access to standard compliant markets. Low producer capacity to comply with and maintain requirements, requirements both related to the standards as well as buyer requirements related to say volumes and quality. Uh, limited access to resources such as financial resources and training environmental constraints like poor, poor soil quality, changing weather patterns, uh, prohibitive costs of certification, supply chain structure and power relations. So that involves limited direct access to buyers, too many intermediaries, low bargaining power. And finally, competition, limited market demand and restrictive trade policies. The next slide, we see that based on interview responses, we found that there are also several enabling conditions that need to be in place to support smallholder farmer access to certified uh, voluntary sustainability standard compliant markets. So first, what we found that was particularly important is having an ecosystem of supporting actors. 
So this can be government agencies, buyers, extension service providers, development organizations, certifiers that work closely with smallholder farmers, offering them information and training on standards, their requirements, the way they operate, accompanying market information. It's also important to have market demand for standard compliant products and the ability of farmers to establish direct links with buyers, so aggregators, retailers, um, instead of relying on various intermediaries. Another enabling factor is having producers organized in groups to enhance their bargaining power and lower costs of compliance. And fourth, price incentives for certified products, as well as sufficient access to financial resources for smallholder farmers to be able to make the investments needed to comply with and maintain standard compliance. The specifics of what these interventions should look like will differ between countries and commodities, but our results suggest that these general enabling factors will have some importance in most contexts. Based on these findings from looking at the coverage of standard criteria, the review of the literature and existing evidence, and our interviews in these six countries, we offer recommendations on how standard setting bodies can strengthen voluntary sustainability standards so they have a greater impact on aspects of the three dimensions of poverty. And these recommendations come from the overall report, including the market access chapter. So we found that VSS can support business and market diversification through better coverage of criteria designed to support entrepreneurship and access to diversified markets and business operations, crop diversification, value addition to crops. They can establish robust monitoring and evaluation systems with supporting agents who regularly engage with farmers to track the performance of their farming practices, assess changes and support learning and continuous improvement, for example, by sharing data with farmers. They can strengthen assurance systems, leveraging technologies that support regular communication with farmers and make grievance mechanisms even more accessible for the use of farmers and their communities. It'll be key to include smallholders in standard decision making. And we do see that some VSS are already making efforts to consult more farmers and involve them in decision making and provide opportunities for group certification. They may also provide information in local languages and through means such as local radio programs and ensure smallholder involvement in decisions through votes as well as veto power in standard governance bodies. We also recommend to cover critical environmental criteria, particularly related to climate resilience, conservation, and biodiversity protection. Standards can also broaden their reach and lower the cost of compliance by adapting international standards to the local context, for example, benchmarking international to international standards, and also through landscape and jurisdictional approaches that take a broader approach to certification. Finally, we recommend to adopt a more gender equality approach. So engage women in developing and implementing and monitoring standards and include criteria that support issues such as women's access to land, training and markets. Next slide. From our research, it's clear that responsibility for enabling smallholder participation in standard compliant markets lies not only with standards, but also depends on having adequate support in place from other actors. So we also make recommendations for standards bodies, value chain actors and governments to ensure that farmers have access to information about standard compliant markets. So they're aware that they exist as an option, what they require, how to comply, cost versus returns, and how to get a compliant product to market. For implementation, there needs to be coordinated support from government, NGOs, standards buyers, financial service providers who work regularly with farmers to provide the services and information they need. Secure land tenure helps smallholders access standard compliant markets and encourages the adoption of sustainable agricultural practices that help maintain soil quality and productivity of the land. So governments can provide incentives, for example, that can be monetary through training, inputs, access to technology, 
for farmers that show improvements in soil quality, adoption of more sustainable farming practices, and positive environmental performance. In terms of stimulating demand, we need consuming countries involved, but also producing countries and their neighbors. And one way could be through official recognition of locally defined standards or local versions of international standards in producing countries. Uh, that can support the trade of compliant goods domestically and with neighboring countries. For example, we see this in the East African community. community it could be in Mercosur. Some standards are starting to incorporate criteria addressing a living wage and living income. And their role could include coordinating with buyers and governments, advancing the definition of a living wage and a living income reference for smallholders and piloting and documenting experiences to support broader adoption. Governments in producing countries can develop infrastructure such as transport, storage, processing, and facilitate direct and structured links between producers, formal traders, aggregators, and buyers, providing guidelines for establishing long-term contracts with smallholders and creating transparency in supply chains. Next slide. So I'd like to leave you with a few main takeaways from the review and from our three pieces of the analysis. Overall, we found that Voluntary sustainability standards can provide benefits to farmers and communities that may then contribute to broader poverty reduction efforts. But it'll be important for standards to cover critical criteria such as living income, business diversification, environment and gender, and to develop approaches that can make compliance more affordable for smallholder farmers. And importantly, to reach smallholder farmers, standards cannot go it alone. There needs to be support from actors such as governments, private sector, and civil society. Thank you. I would like to now open for commentary from our guest speakers. I welcome Honorable Bazivamo from the East African community to say a few words from the government perspective. So thank you. Uh, let me first of all thank you for uh, convening of this uh, uh, discussion, which is uh, very important. And I wish also to commend the work which has been done, which was uh, just presented by Sarah. And I wish only to emphasize the fact that uh, supporting small uh, holders, uh, farmers, is very key especially in uh, these development uh, countries. And uh, building the capacity is just a strong contribution to the reduction of poverty in general. And here I wish maybe to uh, illustrate what I am saying and what she has said by an example. Uh, for example, being the East African community where we, in the six partner states, uh, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, Uganda, and the Republic of South Sudan. But what is happening here is not far different from what is happen happening in Africa or in other developing countries. And I think this will be a kind of uh, image which just show that it is important to move that way and to support smallholders. Uh, so that we can uh, produce in a sustainable way and uh, be, uh, let's say, uh, uh, helped in increase, uh, increasing the uh, livelihoods through these kinds of different approach. I wish to highlight the fact that when it comes to agriculture, it is true in our region, uh, majority of people producing are small uh, holders, farmers. And here we normally say that agriculture plays a role of uh, uh, giving jobs to almost 80% of the population. And uh, it is rural. And under this population, we see that 50%, 52% actually are women. And we see also in this, this population uh, that the population is in general a young population. 
where we have 60% of the whole population being under 25%, uh, 25 years old, and 65% being below 30 years old. And among all these young people, most of them, because it is also uh, what I have said, they are almost 80% of them being in rural and being actually captured under agricultural activities. So here we wish to say that uh, agriculture does play also a very important role when it comes to the GDPs of our uh, countries, where you see that uh, between uh, 25 and 40, uh, percent is a contribution from agriculture or from the national GDP. The maximum would be 42 percent, uh, like in Burundi. So I wish to say that whatever contribution you do in the agriculture sector, small uh, be it, has a very strong impact in reducing the poverty of the population because what you do there has a direct impact of majority of the population, which are 80% of the population, and also plays a role of increasing the GDP because the contribution of uh, between 25 and 42% is a very significant contribution. And here we will see also that when it comes to industries, in East Africa, more than 70% 70, 70 of industries are agro-based industries, meaning dealing with agriculture product, uh, products, or they are uh, uh, industries for agriculture input, being either fertilizers, pesticide, or uh, seeds where it, 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 is, it is being done. So a contribution of uh, in, in agriculture we we'll also have a very strong contribution to industry. But if the industries are running well, this will be helping agriculture to get market. And by agriculture getting market, then you sustain production under this angle of production from agriculture and you are indirectly supporting uh, small farmers. And here, it is also important to note that what has been observed in these, those industries in general is raw material, uh, quality and consistent quantities. Uh, you will be having maybe huge production in one season, in another season you have nothing. Or you are having products which are not good when you treat, then you have like a, a half of the product which has been delivered being uh, eligible for industry and the other one to be put aside or sent back. So by supporting producers, which are majority, majority of them being small farmers, by supporting them, by building the uh, skills, knowledge, especially when it comes to which standards do you have to respect, what have you to do so that your product can be uh, uh, well appreciated in the, 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 the market, especially to industries, then you are actually contributing a lot because by building the, the capacity, you are not only contributing to increasing the production and the uh, income, but you are also contributing to uh, improving what industries are doing and uh, industries can sustain and keep on being the market for agriculture. But on the other side, you will note that uh, when it comes to trade, what we trade, 65% in uh, uh, the region, when you talk about intra-trade, is about agriculture commodities. So whatever you do in agriculture, building for capacity for small farmers who are the majority of the population, you are even contributing to quality trade, if you build the capacity on how to handle what they are producing, uh, you, you, you uh, build the knowledge when it comes to standards, what do you put on the market, which standards this should be respecting, you are indirectly contributing to the whole 
actually uh, value chain and you are building uh, socio-economic uh, 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 strong impact on the whole population. And here I wish to say that uh, we are been developing uh, some measures, including uh, this phytosanitary, sanitary and phytosanitary measures, especially because you, you, you see in East Africa, uh, when it comes to post-harvest losses, uh, this is uh, between uh, 20 and 40 for 40%. Uh, normally you have an average of almost 30% post harvest losses. So it is important when you think about how do you handle, build capacity, build the skills of farmers so that the products are not lost even before reaching the market, even before they are traded. So by doing this, you are strengthening them, you are helping them to get income, and indirectly you are increasing the actual livelihood and improving the, the livelihood and you are uh, 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 contributing to the whole economy, but indirectly or directly reducing the poverty of the population in general. So uh, dealing with smallholders, uh, standards, uh, has a strong impact on trade and uh, working on improving uh, or doing kind of trade facilitation, you are also indirectly improving the livelihood of uh, of the population, but you are impacting the economy in general. And we think supporting agriculture and working in this area of uh, uh, small farmers, sustainability standards, you are indirectly actually uh, uh, contributing to the increase of the GDP of our uh, different countries. And when it comes to that, then uh, socioeconomically, uh, you are doing a good thing. And I want to actually just to support what was presented and to say this is an area of concerns because whenever you do a positive thing there, you are uh, having a positive impact in uh, the whole uh, economy of the countries. If things are bad, like climate change, uh, negative impact, then this will be also impacting uh, negatively on the majority of the population because small farmers are the most vulnerable. Um, you, 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 when you build the resilience to them, when you help them to adapt to climate change. So for the whole story is you are uh, uh, contributing to the reduction of poverty. And uh, this is actually on direction or on, on orientation where we have to look into and uh, ensure uh, we are changing what is happening on the ground. And one Thank of the measures to be taken is also to work on procurement, because normally public procurement should be focusing on supporting uh, when it comes to uh, food or agro uh, commodities, uh, on supporting uh, small farmers so that they have a certain market, and also promoting local consumption is also an element to be to consider to ensure the market is sustained. And by sustaining the market, you are also sustaining the, the, the socioeconomic uh, uh, sector of our East African community citizens in general, but also in the whole Africa, in, the, in other, other development, develop, the developing countries. So thank you, and thank you for having to listen to me. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Tazivamo. Thank you for those insights and for really highlighting how supporting smallholder farmers is also supporting the broader economy and the importance of, of that focus and also the role that governments can play in supporting that. I'd like to now invite uh, Norbert Tuyashime from the Eastern African Farmers Federation to say a few words. Welcome, Norbert. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Uh, First of all, uh, I thank the organization for having a thought of organizing this kind of a gathering. Uh, I remember sometimes back when uh, you initiated uh, this study, we were somehow peripheral involved in some few discussions. So as EFF, we are actually very glad that uh, you've concluded and um, 
I'm sure I have skimmed through the report and I've gone through the executive summary. It has a, a very useful information. And actually, <clears throat> for us who work for farm organization, we don't do a lot of studies or research. Eh? So um, we, we are for us yeah, VSS or uh, Voluntary Sustainable Standards. Eh? Yeah, it is still uh, at a term which is somehow relatively new that uh, we really need to get into deep or, uh, of it. Uh, my contribution, uh, quickly I can say that, uh, yeah, they, your findings are very much in what I think different stakeholders uh, yeah, could believe. Eh? If we could uh, undertake a similar analysis, we could come up with. Eh? But our focus, because our interests, uh, the constituents we represent is 80% uh, 80 smallholder farmers. So one of uh, so my my focus is on uh, on how probably we from the findings of your studies probably even going forward uh, so probably what yeah what is our interest so our interest uh, first is that when you look at um, yeah the standards is a major hindrance uh, for the smallholder farmers to access the markets I say this because yeah probably here we are talking of voluntary. I don't know how voluntary it is, because eh? I see compliance. When it comes to compliance, it be, it becomes something you are, uh, if you are not complying with, of course you understand that there is something you are not getting. So normally the standards are there, are developed by um, uh, value chain uh, players, then they are pushed to smallholder farmers. So then we, in that case, you'll find that yeah, they will adopt them yeah, forcefully because yeah, they know at the end of the day they, they will not have where to offload their produce. Yeah, in um, this, I'm saying mainly in cash crops, yeah, which I think is the focus of your, your study. When you look at coffee in, in uh, across the countries, eh? yes, we don't consume, like especially in Sub-Sahara, our consumption is very low. So if you produce coffee, you have no choice, is to make sure that you are complying with what the market is imposing to you. So one element I want to bring here is that, yeah, at what cost? At what cost to the smallholder farmers? Because I want to, re to relate to it, because the way you framed your study is that you want to show how the standards they can contribute to alleviate poverty, which in your, argument and assessment and the findings, uh, everything is perfect, but sometimes it's not that linear. Probably, <clears throat> yeah, when you look at uh, um, value chains that are not very well uh, developed or structured, eh, so you'll find that uh, those standards, they come at a cost. They come at a cost for the farmers because not all the value chain, they pay premium. I know probably yeah, in coffee and other well-developed uh, uh, value chains, so they will pay premium to the uh, to the farmers. So they are trying to reward them for their extra effort to be able to produce according to uh, given criteria. But when you go to like uh, food uh, food crops, though the food crops also I can mention the cereals, the pulses, also they are marketed. But when you look at them, yeah, sometimes our members they produce them for a fast subsistence. So it basically means when they are going to the market, they don't go there with standards. So if someone comes with standards, it's basically you are trying to tell them, I'm not able to give you a good price because your produce is not good. So which basically we say that is a hindrance to us when we are complying to, the, to them, uh, it's basically someone is imposing them to you sometimes we find it treacherous, not in a good way. So my suggestion here is that which and that I, I find it in the recommendation, we are very glad that uh, all the stakeholders in the value chain should be consulted. They should be consulted. Then we get to understand uh, at what cost at each level. So what are the necessary conditions? Because I'm glad, but I will I was going to be very much happy that if the financial resources or financial services was treated separate 
not uh, put under uh, access to resources because you will find smallholder farmers by the fact that they don't access finances. There are so many things when they are producing, they are not able to uh, able to do. So in that way, you find that they produce with raw quality, but what you are uh, we in not appropriate environment or even not having all the necessary, even uh, sort of uh, requirement, even in terms of uh, documentation, having proper uh, structures so that you say that you are doing business. So here it's a. Uh, um, I'm really looking at this conversation and I'm seeing it very important. And our role is that as a farm organization, basically is to bring those smallholder farmers which are scattered together so that we say that we assist them to access those different uh, uh, services. In this regard, yes, we, we should be able to, to disseminate these kind of findings to them, but specifically practical, practical, um, practical uh, issues related to the standards, and by demonstrating them, by adopting them, more uh, there are chances that they are going to increase their market access. They are going to increase their income uh, through better prices and uh, premiums, and therefore that yeah we. Uh, these will contribute to the reduction of uh, uh, po uh, poverty. So uh, I, we can talk, 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 and uh, <laughs> yeah, and I know that the other uh, uh, speakers. Eh? So I want to end by congratulating you. These are very good discussion. Yeah, what I want to bring you um, is to consider the complexity of these uh, uh, standards then we we'll be able to understand that the smallholder farmers, sometimes they don't have uh, uh, the capacities eh, to analyze every aspect of it. Because there are times mm -hmm. those standards, they come with a hidden uh, hidden cost or a hidden agenda. Yes, yeah, someone would tell you, oh, if you don't do A, B, C, D, you will not get. And then they say they are voluntary, but because they know they have no choice. So we really need to look at the complexity issues of uh, the standards. We look at uh, the stakeholders' capabilities. I believe that uh, normally as EFF, we, we aspire where smallholder farmers could be key value chain players, uh, key value chain players, so that they can be treated equally when there is an, an idea, uh, something which is being developed, they are, in t they are part and parcel of it. And uh, uh, finally, um, to think that uh, when we unlock the market, as we believe, we will be able to unlock uh, the productivity issues, the issues of uh, access to the other uh, services, which I believe that the standards are very important for us because they enable smallholder farmers access to the market. So I thank you and I'm still around. Uh, if there will be some other question or comment for me to take, uh, we'll appreciate. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Norbert. And I'm really glad that you highlighted this issue that standards, you know, we call them voluntary sustainability standards, but as they increase in prominence, uh, they are becoming de facto mandatory in many cases for farmers. And that really it's bringing that voice of, of farmers into the, into the process and into um, into the conversation to really be able to, to best support. So I appreciate that perspective, thank you. And looking forward to also hearing from Marike de Pena from Fair Trade and also with the Banana Cooperative in Dominican Republic. Welcome. Thank you very much. And I really think Norbert, Norbert made some very good points. Uh, starting with that, uh, in fair trade uh, and in Latin America, we rep represent over 1,000 uh, organizations, mainly smallholder organizations in 24 countries. Uh, and we are the proud owner, co owner of a uh, voluntary sustainability scheme um, uh, already for over 30 years. 
Uh, and having said that, when we started with Fred Rate, uh, it wasn't called VSS. Uh, and there weren't so much VSS schemes. And definitely, I, I agree with Normand. Um, currently, VSS is, is maybe voluntarily in the market, but not so voluntarily for smallholders. Uh, because many times it's a, a take it or leave it request. If you don't have this scheme, you cannot sell this product. So, so I definitely agree. When in fair trade, we started 30 years ago, if our focus was not so much on standards. Our focus was on that smallholders need a price uh, so they can cover the cost of sustainable production and can uh, build decent livelihoods for their families and live from the product they produce. So that was the main focus. And the other focus was on the third pillar of your work, Saya, was about empowerment. We need very strong organizations and producer participations uh, to make sure that uh, small farmers can position themselves in market and can build decent livelihoods, negotiating better prices and better trade conditions. So empowerment and organization is key in fair trade as the driver of development. And standards are more supporting tools. So when, when we talk about compliance and compliance and compliance, maybe this is a wrong focus. Standards need to be guidance at, for producers. So they guide producers in implementing practices. And these practices need to be uh, covered by the prices producers receive because practices based on standards, based on compliance, end up in being burdens. Uh, but practices supported by uh, skill development uh, programs, projects, and also prices that cover implementations guide producers towards a uh, major sustainability. So I think it's very important for whatever VSS scheme that all these schemes need to cover the three pillars you meant that are key for poverty reduction. So resources, not only skills, but also economic resources. Um, Skills building, not only depending on third parties as governance and businesses, but this needs to be integrated. So you cannot have a criteria if you don't have access to the information and the training you need to implement the criteria. No? So it, it needs to be an integrated VSS scheme. And in, in, in fair trade, we offer these services integrated. So it's not depending on governments nor on, on businesses. And, and definitely the power expand. So the three components are key and, and it's not always guaranteed. Uh, and, and what I see as a challenge in VSS that for producers is not always VSS, <laughs> uh, is that some tackle the social issues, other tackle the environmental issues, and then at the end on the producer level, you end up with two, three, four schemes, partly duplicating criteria, partly new criteria. Not all the, the, the schemes are a guaranteeing a premium nor a sustainable prices. Uh, so sometimes, even with all the good intentions, it ends up to be a burden for smallholders. And having said that, also the impact of VSS not only depends on the standards, not only depends on if the, the VSS come with good prices, it also depends on the volume sold to VSS markets. So you can have all the certification, all the compliance, and all the enabling factors you need. Uh, but if the market is unstable and not growing, uh, farmers uh, still are challenging with the sustainability because they need to comply as, as a farmer, as an organization, but not all the products can be uh, sold to more sustainable markets. And the other component is um, the long-term commitment of businesses uh, to be part of these sustainability schemes or the sustainability markets. And, and this is key because even if we have the standards, all these processes 
um, need long-term commitments uh, because sustainability, you cannot build it from now to tomorrow. Even less if we, if we have so much external factors affecting um, sustainability, sustainable farming. So business commitment with VSS is key. And also supply chain standards. Uh, because what I see in your report, Sarah, is that uh, the VSS standards maybe are focused on producers and to support producers, but supply chains have a role to play. Uh, and this role cannot be voluntary because it's if it's voluntary it's it's something that could be in place or couldn't be in place so having the supply chain with certain roles that are also guaranteed by standards is key one of it is paying a fair price paying a premium but also giving this and delivering this support uh, farmers need to comply with the criteria uh, standards uh, are asking for no uh, you already in your report you said well climate change you can make all the progress you made but you if you hit by climate change well you go two past two steps back covid hasn't been easy for small farmers but also the conventional market trend is 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 difficult and i haven't seen it in the report because in, in the market, what we have seen the last three years, even more, but already for decades, that prices are flexible and in the last decades are going down, down, down. And if prices are going down and aspirations are going up and even worse, if all these aspirations are linked, um, uh, are, are not covered by a price uh, and prices are going down, uh, farmers stay with the aspirations and they are unable to comply with it. So I think conventional market trends are worrying and we need to take it into account. Uh, also, the lack of, of farmers um, in, in being consulted or being part of a standard setting. Um, uh, the lack of consultation, consultation imports uh, ends up in having a huge range of standards not always um, adapted to local conditions, not always built on farmers' priorities and needs, and not always taken into account a farmer's capacity to comply. And I think standards need to be built on farmers' needs, uh, on farmers' capacity, and on farmers' purity, and need to be adapted to local context. And you you have that very well in your reports. Maybe finalizing, I think there are some work streams now taking up that are very important and could support VSS schemes, um, uh, but also sustainability in general. And this is the work about the true value of food. And uh, having said that prices are not always covering the sustainable cost of production and even less the, the, the cost of living. Uh, but also farmers don't have real benchmarks. What farmers need to negotiate to be able to cover this uh, sustainable cost of production. So the whole work, work that is going to take is being taken up, I think, by the UN and the working group about the true value of food is key because we need this benchmark for farmers and businesses to make sure that prices are going more towards. Uh, this uh, this true value of food and cover the true value of food and to avoid also social and environmental externalities that we currently have in farmers on the human rights side but also on the environmental side and the other work stream that i feel is underdeveloped is about living income living income we have a lot of initiative uh, there is not a clear tool uh, it doesn't co cover the cost of climate change uh, on farming and the cost of climate change, change of living. So there is work to do to understand what a farmer need to earn to be able to live from the product he or she produces. Uh, and I think this is very important because if you currently go to the to the social part um, of compliance, it's very much based on decent working conditions and not so much on decent living conditions for farmers. 
And I think uh, with regards to enabling conditions, I completely agree. Maybe adding to it's important to have supply chain standards. Uh, so also businesses have a clear role to play. And with, uh, with regards to the government, I think government has a, have a role to place, play also in developing their own local markets and taking part of what this sustainable or voluntarily sustainable standards pop into their policies and also making sure that foods cannot be cheap even if it's in local market because a cheap food affects farmers income and sustainable farming. Thank you Marike. I think you raised some really important parts and uh, points and I'm really glad you also point the direction back to the fact that we need to include the voice of smallholder farmers and that there's a role to play for others as well uh, and a commitment from others uh, in the supply chain. Hank, could we please uh, bring you up to make a few comments on the perspective of Rainforest Alliance? Yes, uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, first of all, I, I, I need to say that uh, that uh, I that we can agree with the high level conclusions and recommendations that you have made in the report. I think they confirm what we have seen and learned from our work on a day to day basis and also going back 10, 20 years since we have uh, been um, created and grown as as voluntary standard Rainforest Alliance and, and also after the merger with Oud certified. So I think there is little dispute about your analysis. I, I really like the way you have framed the, the backdrop of uh, uh, poverty as the main concern that we share, all of us around the table, and being that, that color wheel that says it's, it's about access to resources, it's about creating opportunities and access of farmers to, to opportunities, and it's about power and choice. Um, if we look into that wheel and we zoom in in the gradient of colors there, I think there is only so much that voluntary standards, and I will get to Norbert's point uh, uh, in, a, in a minute, uh, there's only so much that we can really influence. So we can have some influence on prices by adding a premium, uh, but even that is, is being a challenge because the way markets operate, uh, we have seen a tendency to to, to, to the race uh, to, to for the cheapest uh, available commodity. And I think that relates to the nature of the, of the sectors we are working with. In the case of Rainforest Alliance, it's the banana, the tea, the coffee, the cocoa sector, uh, which are basically agri agricultural commodities traded at a global level with value chains that are highly skewed uh, in the direction of the of the buyer, and I think buyers hold most of the power there. And there's not so much that voluntary standards have uh, changed that balance. And I think the academic research over the past 20, 30 years has time and again confirmed this. Um, um, uh, the, the access of smallholders to, uh, I think, the key <laughs> productive resource of farmers is land. We do not influence how much land a smallholder has, and we have we're having uh, um, very um, profound discussions in uh, with regard to living income and the cocoa sector. Like, okay, how realistic is it that adoption of standards, no matter how well they get adopted, will help farmers who have uh, who are under a certain threshold in terms of their farm size? Uh, uh, will help them to, to get out of poverty. And we have sufficient data now that we can also say, okay, if this is the, 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 the level of, of yields and, and productivity of farmers, how much would a price increase of say, let's double the price, how much farmers then would be above the, the who would meet a living income benchmark. So price uh, has been very much an, and is, on, on, on the farmer's mind, because it's the main uh, uh, determinant of, of their income, in addition to, of course, the yields they produce and the costs they have. Uh, but looking at smallholders as a, as a category that is quite differentiated, uh, it's even so that 
in a hypothetical case, if you would double the price, you will still have a lot of farmers who are still not able to make the living income from their main cash crop. Um, I think certification uh, and voluntary standards have been able to create opportunities. Um, uh, I think the main, um, the main thing we have seen happening is that the, the, the buyers and the value chain have, uh, have, uh, have connected and have made transparent who they source from and have committed to supporting smallholders and have provided services such as training, agricultural inputs, access to, to, to fertilizers, credit, have uh, helped uh, organize these uh, producers. Um, but not everybody is in the same condition to, to use these opportunities. And you mentioned gender, I think that is, uh, uh, that is the case in, in many situations where uh, the cash crop is managed by male household, by, by the male in a household and, and, and women take care of the, of the food crops. There's nothing that certification changes in that respect because we, we are operating on that export cash crop and we're not in a position that we can change the, the power allocation within households. I think that's, that's too much to ask from us and we have to, to acknowledge that we, we work with the, the powers that are there and the, the culture that is there. And uh, there's not so much we can change coming from the outside. In terms of power and choice, um, I think voluntary standards being created and developed to respond to a demand in consumer markets for products that are more sustainable have the imprint of the destiny markets being the consumers, you call it the, 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 the importing countries or the North. And um, I think the complaint and uh, the, the, the assessment by Norbert uh, and Marika that, uh, that, that standards uh, are um, imposed via market mechanisms on producers is largely correct. There's, there's nothing I could, I can bring in that would uh, create, uh, that would alter this. We have to acknowledge that. So the global commodity markets working as they work with the actors that are they, that's the point of entrance of voluntary standards and they cannot correct the genetic imprint of how this market works. I'm not saying that it's, it's something that cannot be changed. But I think then we need to analyze how we can improve the leverage and the, the bargaining power of farmers as uh, within their own country, but also vis-a-vis -vis the supply, the, the value chain actors that are buying from them. Uh, and um, in that respect, indeed, they're not, they're not voluntary. And I think here it's important to look at where, where and how standards originated. I mean, they, they were created also to fill a regulatory void that national governments and, uh, and, and, and the governance system had left open or unaddressed. So I, I, I hope that, that uh, national countries become also um, uh, more willing and able, to, for example, to to, to raise minimum wages so that the, the, the living wage uh, requirements in standards get more traction in national legislation. So uh, that's, that's, uh, that's uh, an aspect where I have seen over the past 10 years really some positive developments. Um, the discussion about living wage, the acceptance that it's unfair and it's undecent to have uh, large numbers of, of workers on, on agricultural farms not earning a living wage. We also see that from the industry, there is uh, in some actors, a genuine interest to say, okay, how can we source uh, these products and pay sufficient so that a living wage can be implemented? And there is there are a lot of obstacles that need to be addressed there because it's easier said than done. If you consider that, for example, a tea buyer buys only a very small portion from each of their suppliers and 
paying a higher price does not automatically translate into a living wage because those farms, those estates that produce tea are selling to many buyers mm -hmm. and not all buyers are willing to, to, to have this commitment. So I think we have to address some of the mechanisms as well and be bold in designing mechanisms that allow those who want to move forward to, to, make, to make steps. And Rainforest Alliance, I think, is, is, is uh, piloting and testing some of those uh, 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 some of those initiatives, and not not all of them are a success because we fail more often than we succeed. Uh, but we're there trying to 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 find mechanisms to transmit that value from one end to the for, of the value chain to another. Um, I think you raise a really good point that we're all learning as we're as we're going, and there seem to be some key themes that are arising, and really looking forward to continuing these discussions, particularly as the full report is available today. I'd like to open dialogue uh, with the co-authors to comment. And uh, Nima, do you have any remarks? Um, yeah, thank you, Sarah, for, for the presentation. And also thank you to all the commentators for the very valuable comments and great the point they raised. Uh, I'm just going to try to add a very brief point from a research point of view and uh, to raise uh, the issue of uh, the need for more research. So with Sarah, Cristina, and Santiago, we worked on chapter four that focused on understanding farmer access to VSS compliant market. And we aim through this study to shed the light on what are the factors that influence smallholder access and how we can harness the enabling factors and also try to um, limit or mitigate the, the limiting factors. Um, one thing I would like also to highlight that the choice of the countries was based on a critical analysis that included different factors, um, macroeconomic factors and other. And we um, paid attention to the, to the significance of the agriculture to the GDP, as what was mentioned by uh, Honorable uh, Bazi Barmo, uh, the DSG of um, Eastern African East African Community, and. Um, one thing from a, from a research point of view that although there were so many similarities uh, in terms of the responses we got from, from different countries, from the six countries we, we interviewed, uh, like for example, they all mentioned that uh, the challenges for them are the lack of knowledge, education, skills, lack of time, lack of financial services, uh, access to financial services and et cetera. However, each country had its own unique story to tell. And this signifies the need to collect data and to work with the back end of the value chain and to interview farmers and smallholders and producers. For example, just to mention one thing, for example, in the case of Cambodia, um, we know that VSS compliance require cash flow uh, to continue and to meet the necessary standards. For example, in the case of Cambodia, there was uh, an issue of delay of payment uh, from buyers to producers, to VSS compliant producers, and this worsens the need for cash flow. And this also tells a lot about the power and the voice in the value chain, one of the dimensions of poverty, and also it's linked to, um, to what was mentioned in, in this matter. So uh, given that the uh, those buyers, those uh, producers don't have uh, um, or don't have much power, or they voice their voice is not that much heard. Uh, they couldn't deal with the issue of the delay of payment, and this also takes me back to my point of the need of uh, of uh, conducting uh, research and collecting data uh, from 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 the field. And also, um, when we disaggregated the data based on the um, participants groups in the case of producers, for example, uh, when we looked at the aggregated data from all countries, all the respondents refer to the high price and, and the uh, price premium as the main advantage to them. But when we, we disaggregated the data and looked at the producers, actually producers highlighted improved uh, or access to training as the main advantage for them. And here the producers do value the training, do value the capacity building that is brought to them by uh, complying with the VSS. And this is also linked to the issue of capacity building that was mentioned by 
um, mostly all the commentators in, in their comments. They look at the training as a way to improve the technical knowledge and capacity, uh, thing that improves the farm practices for them, helps them in acquire quality inputs and also to improve the productivity and the product quality. So uh, we need to listen to the producers and to know what they need more. Uh, and, and through the study, we were able in six countries to highlight what are the main issues, but I would like also to highlight the need of more research and to do a research we need data and we need transparency uh, also from the standards organization because this will help in conducting more research and this will help a lot in making informed policy decisions when, when we have data and when we have um, better knowledge about what's going on in the field. Uh, that's it from my side and thank you Sarah. Thank you Nima, you say it very well. Yeah. I pass it now over to Christina to open yeah. the dialogue. Very good. Thanks uh, very much, everyone. Very strong uh, opinions, insightful comments. Uh, we could uh, talk for more. Very, very thank you for that. Look, we have uh, quite a few questions. I'm going to be able to address a couple of them. The others, we can uh, uh, answer them uh, and, and provide information in the launch in our website on Tuesday, if you can follow up on that. Look, it seems to be a, a consensus like the importance of including smallholder farmers on, on, on forest standards to, to address the needs of smallholder farmers, enhancing training capacity and so forth. All of you mentioned that. There is some questions regarding how we can, or how standards do incorporate more smallholders vision in addition to the consultation process. Uh, of, of the development of the standards. So maybe, Hank, can you uh, expand on that? You know, how, how farmers are included in the decision-making process uh, when, uh, when the standards are defined in addition to the consultation? Yeah. Um, I, I think if you, the, the, we have recently launched the 2020 Rainforest Agriculture, Sustainable Agriculture Standard. It, it had a nine months, one year consultation process with 10,000 um, entries of, of stakeholders giving their input. I went through the list and indeed not many smallholders were there because it takes quite some knowledge and some access to information and honestly some time, some time and, and, and capacity to, to, to relate to a whole text of a new standard. So we uh, we have received a lot of input. We have also received a lot of pushback to trying to raise the standard on certain aspects. And that pushback came from the more organized producers. I mean, when we say producers, we are speaking of uh, banana plantations in, in Latin America, as well as uh, uh, smallholders who produce tea in Kenya and are associated with the Kenyan Tea Development uh, Authority uh, and some and other cooperatives. So um, our standard caters to the needs to all of those in principle. The more organized producers were able to, to really push back on, for example, living income. And, uh, and, 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 and object to what they see as uh, this is coming from, from Europe and, and we want it, they want to impose higher costs here and we have a good legal framework in our country. So why would you regulate our national affairs? So questioning the legitimacy of rainforest to set a higher standard for what they consider, well, in our country, say Ecuador, we do already have, a salario digno, and that's 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 good enough for us. So it was a, a tug of war uh, to 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 keep the living wage requirements in the standards to make it meaningful, so that people could make transparent what the gap to the living wage is, and then make progress. I think there's there's something that we cannot haven't been able to regulate to the extent of producers. Uh, expected and, and, and from us, and that is the rewards coming from this, from the value chain. So we cannot dictate the price, we cannot even dictate a premium, because that will, that, that has, uh, we, we have to some extent been able to negotiate and agree on minimum levels of premium, and we are about to see if that minimum actually acts functions as a minimum, or if that is a ceiling where the buyers say, okay, this is what we pay. We, we have reached an agreement on this level of premium and we will not go beyond. The theory says being a market and 
uh, it should have a race to the top and a competition to, to overbid your competitors and get more of the supply if you pay a higher premium uh, for certified production. Um, still, still not, uh, we will have to see if that's going to happen. So market dynamics are uh, quite difficult for, for us to influence. Now, uh, in the implementation of the standard, we have uh, uh, had early implementer pilots where we uh, were more able to listen to how it's landing and how smallholders are uh, uh, implementing the standard and what they need to be able to implement it. So, um, uh, but to be honest, the, the body, in the governance body of Rainforest Alliance that takes the final decision about is this going to be the standard for the next couple of years does not have smallholders represented. It's a club of people with good intentions and knowledge of different sectors who are part of the RA governance body who take this decision. I think that is a governance uh, aspect from our own system that we have to acknowledge. Uh, but having said that, we also have to be aware that Rainforest is not equal to only the certification program and the standard. We do other things. So the, the governance of the standard is conflated with the governance of the organization. So maybe we need to think of uh, a different uh, body that can truly uh, uh, take into account the the, uh, the input of other state of the smallholders. Thanks very much, Hank, for your transparency and thorough answer. Uh, we have another question coming with, with regards to the crop income. Uh, of farmers. Uh, I would like to take it to Norbert as well as Mirike. We're going to spend a bit on time. So uh, in the findings of the report, uh, we find that, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, farmers obtain crop income uh, increases. Uh, however, it might not be that high. So what are the benefits of being certified or continuing being uh, compliant with volunteer sustainability standards if the increase in crop income is not in a, a lot? Norbert, Marieke, can you uh, address that? Whoever want to start, Marieke, Norbert? I, I can start maybe. I, I, I think it may be contrary to what Hank was saying. It, it, I don't think you can build any standard without smallholder uh, consultation and even uh, participation in decision making. And when, it, when this is the case, you are able to build standards that are, that are feasible and producers are able to implement them. Um, and this can raise income. Having said that, it's not only depending on standards, it's depending on market dynamics. And I think Hank is right. The only thing is that I think uh, voluntary uh, standards can influence this market the, the dynamics if we would certify the supply chain. I don't think it, at this stage, when we have aspiration to reduce poverty, we can keep on saying markets are as they are, as they were 100 years ago. So, because this is part of the problem we have. If we simply accept them, we never will break through it and we don't achieve our objectives. So I think it's a combination. Uh, farmers need to be part of the standards. So we are not demanding what is not feasible. Market demands need to be changed also through standard setting. And then we probably would achieve the income. Uh, thank you. What I can add is that <clears throat> I'm in agreement. Eh? Yeah, we look at the start standards as one of the elements, eh? but uh, when we, we look at uh, the whole value chain, there are different stakeholders, all should be involved. Eh? So you, yeah, the smaller farmers are just there, yeah, upstream producing. Yeah, that's what they do best. So you really need to bring them on board. Eh? And actually nowadays we have uh, different, uh, uh, farm organization that are representing their interests. You know, we have EFF. There are like five of them in the continent. We have the Pan-African Farm Organization. We have the World uh, Farmers Organization. So, yeah, we don't miss the platform that yeah, can be able to engage effectively when it comes on how 
yeah, to advocate uh, for their interests. So what I think is uh, our interest eh, is that when there is this kind of a discussion, it's just to involve them. It's not actually even consulting them because they are part and parcel of the value chain. Eh? So they are equal partner. So, but we, sometimes people, they tend to think that, okay, I'm there. Let me just develop something for them. Then you push them. Yeah, because you think they don't know things. Eh? So there are things they know you, you don't know. So that's what we really actually, yes, equally there are things you know, them they don't know because you are at different levels. But uh, wouldn't we wouldn't want a situation that uh, it's a kind of like, uh, yeah, there's someone who did really understand what yeah, needs to be done. Eh? So then, yeah, you are pushing to the smallholder farmers. But when you go, you talk to them, you able to demonstrate how the standards, they are going to uh, bring them more income. They are going to breed resilience. Yeah, because they are concerned about their future. I'm sure that they will be able to, yeah, instead of practicing in a way that is not sustainable, I can be incentivized in terms of changing my practice. But basically, it's just bringing them on board and then you work with them you will be able to know what they are able to do, what they are not able to do. You will be able to work with them and you change. But if standard is one is one element. So you really need to look at this comprehensively. What I appreciate, you are looking at the standards in a, a broad aspect of market-driven approach, which I think everybody is looking at it because it's, it's the only way to unlock other economic services that the agriculture sector uh, needs to be able uh, to go to the next level. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Norbert and Marike, for your answers. Look, we are a bit over the time. Uh, I'm just going to address a final question to an Honorable Basivamo, uh, and then we can go to concluding remarks with my colleague Santiago. Honorable Basivamo, how, what would be, uh, how would you see the potential of uh, uh, linking the standards to uh, national re legislation, regulation, or you know, at the Eastern Africa community level, so that uh, governments can support uh, enforcement or implementation uh, uh, of uh, complying with the standard uh, practices. Uh, so, governments are part of the process. Standards goes together with standards authorities, especially when you think already about uh, trading, it cannot be seen otherwise. And here in the region, what you are targeting now is to see things, you know, broader way. As we were used to develop standards at regional level, for East African Community Partner States. Now we are thinking about how to address the bigger market of the whole continent. It is true we have been working in a way of developing standards targeting export of products from our partner state to Europe or other foreign countries outside Africa. But now we have seen Africa is a big market, especially when it comes to East African continental free trade area. And in that process, you cannot uh, do it without implication of uh, revolving government. As I said, it is important and it is a must to work together with uh, uh, farmers organizations, uh, our partners, but most especially to be linked with the African uh, Organization for Standardization to ensure that whatever you are doing at partner state level, whatever is being at regional level, is feeding the whole continent and the whole world because all the standards which were discussed normally are also linked with the best practices in the whole world. So what I wish to highlight here is when you talk about trade, you cannot do it actually in an adequate way without thinking about standards. Even if it is a cost, 
it has to be actually accepted as that and we, we try to see how maybe this cost can be uh, reduced, but uh, it is inevitable. And uh, it pays also. Once you are competitive on the market and you have a sustained market or a sustainable market, then you can increase your production in a sustainable way and uh, you can benefit from it in a sustainable way. But if you do not have a standard and you are not respecting them, then you are fragile and whichever is coming on board can frustrate you. And uh, if you do not consider it as a government, at the end, you are not helping your farmers, you are not helping your traders. And it is important we see actually this in a very integrated way where you have uh, uh, farmers, you have uh, traders, you have uh, also government institutions. Uh, to ensure what you are doing is something which will be not actually addressing the challenges at partner state level only, but uh, being seen in a wider way uh, uh, to help your agriculture uh, uh, stakeholders uh, in a, a sustained, sustained way, uh, which will be profitable for them for long. So this is what I wanted to highlight. And uh, as I have said, we, we look into agriculture, we see it is a very important sector and farmers have to be capacitated. It's important, they have uh, uh, to, to have skills. And uh, we, we see industries, in between we see these regulatory authorities, which are standards authorities, and uh, food and uh, uh, drugs authorities, which will be looking in this framework, what is happening and uh, to avoid surprise then you have to bring everyone on board. So industries, trade, and uh, uh, farmers and regulatory authorities uh, have really to be uh, captured in the loop uh, to ensure uh, good achievement in a sustainable way. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ronald de Basimano, for, for pointing us to the development of the African Union and harmonization of the standards and potential opportunities for smallholder farmers in Africa to sell compliant products locally certified in their continent. Look, um, we are over the time. I'm going to pass the word to my colleague uh, Santiago uh, Fernandez de Cordoba from Junta to do some concluding remarks. And uh, yeah, please, Santiago. Well, thanks, Christina. Thanks, Sara. And um, thanks to all the commentators. Um, I'm going to be extremely brief, uh, but I'm going to say basically that I believe this is really the beginning of this type of dialogue. I think we're running out of time, but at the same time, we're achieving what we wanted with this uh, type of research the, to ignite the dialogue among policymakers, about producers among you know the whole international community and for that reason you know I wrote some some of the key takeaways in, in, in the chat box because obviously we didn't have the time to go through them but I just want to have a key message uh, to the audience the key message is basically we in UNCTAD were working in these issues related to voluntary sustainability standards and of course uh, related to international trade because our beneficiaries the developing countries feel that this is an important issue in the in international trade arena. They feel that it's an issue that needs the attention of the international community so that they can achieve their valid development goals, you know. And uh, we feel that the role of the international community in many of the aspects that have been mentioned today and in many of the aspects that are raised in the study is fundamental in uh, from the areas, of course, of, uh, you know, understanding information, transparency, the role of government, governments, even, even we feel that there should be attention maybe to the need of more financial resources that are available for smallholder producers. And maybe this is kind of the role that we feel ourselves, uh, we are entrusted in a way, uh, in a nice way from our beneficiaries and uh, from the 
beneficiaries of our work. For that, uh, I just want to say that this has been a fantastic experience working together. I just want to say that there's been 18 months of work, 18 months of work. We're putting together a workshop of one hour and 15 minutes, and it's extremely difficult to synthesize 18 months of work that mostly Christina, Sara, and of course, my colleague Nima and Gary were uh, together with Anne and many others. And uh, we feel that this is just the beginning of uh, the intense dialogue on this issue that, we, that of course, Cristina Sara ISD has brought, which is the link of sustainability standards, market access, and poverty elevation. Thanks to all, and thanks, Cristina, to you. Thank you, Santiago, very much. We actually, they, this report is a result of three years and a half of work, but uh, that's uh, even, even more. Thanks, everyone. Wonderful interventions. Thanks for being with us. Very solid uh, insights and a great valuable debate. And this is what we need to improve and to uh, continue advancing sustainability through trade and volunteer sustainability standards and benefiting as Mohole farmers at the center. This is uh, the main message of the, of the session. Follow us in the launch of the main report on Tuesday. I share the, uh, the report link for you now, and we will be able to answer the remaining questions in a document in our website, so you could be able to review that. Uh, thanks, everyone, and please continue enjoying the, the Sustainability and Trade Hub.